Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again. Welcome again to the house of the Lord. Welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, our morning service on Sunday. Welcome and you'll be, ble you be blessed. Please join us. Let us start with a word of prayer. Today in the morning I was reading and it came to me uh, the book of Psalms 42. Like the deer was thirst, longing for the water. Let us even us be thirst for the righteousness of the Lord. Let us be thirst how we approach the our mighty God because he is our life. Let us go in prayer but in hunger to seek his presence, in hunger to seek him like never before. Let's, let's forget about anything just for a few minutes and let us seek the presence of the Lord. Let us seek him in our lives even wherever we are, oh Lord Jesus. Oh Lord, I worship you. I give you all the praise, oh Lord Father. Thank you for your name. Thank you for who you are, oh Lord Jesus. Today, oh Lord, I'm thirsty for your righteousness, oh Lord. I'm thirsty for you, oh Lord Jesus. I'm longing like the dear water. was longing for the water. I'm longing for your presence, oh Lord Jesus. I worship you. I give you all the praise, oh Lord Jesus. I pray, oh Lord, for your forgiveness, oh Lord Jesus. I pray for your mercy, oh Lord Jesus. Clean me from the inside and outside, oh Lord. Remove everything is not of fear, oh Lord Jesus. So today's message can put in my heart, oh Lord Jesus. I worship you, I give you all the praise, oh Lord. As we start, oh Lord, we want to start with you, oh Lord Jesus. We want to start with you, oh Lord, and finish with you, oh Lord Jesus. I worship you, I give you all the praise, oh Lord. Bless everyone, whoever they are, oh Lord Jesus. In their working place, in their home, oh Lord Jesus. Or wherever they are, oh Lord, bless them and be with them, oh Lord Jesus. I worship you, I give you all the praise, Father. Thank you for your name, thank you for your everything. As we in this book of prayer, we have some prayer requests. We have some prayer requests. We have one from Sister Doi. Let us remember Sister Doi because her family is back in Myanmar. Everybody knows that in Myanmar there is uh, like a civil war. People are uh, dying every day. Let us remember her family today. Let us put pray, pray the blood of Jesus upon her, upon her family, even upon that country. We want to see Jesus in that country. We want to see a change in that country. Let us also continue praying for Pastor and the family as they preparing for deputation. Let's pray for a miracle. Let us pray for something Amen. great to happen. Let, let this year let expect the extraordinary to happen in, in, in their deputation. Let us go in prayer. Let us remember wherever you have a prayer, you just call it upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord is able to fulfill any desire. Oh, you robot Shinaya Rabasa. Oh, Jesus, I worship you. I give you all the praise, O Lord. Today, O Lord, in the morning, we come with a prayer request in our heart, O Lord Jesus. You have said that even before we ask, you already know it, O Lord Jesus. We proclaim that we need you, O Lord Jesus. We need you like never before, O Lord Jesus. We put Sister Doe in your hands, O Lord Jesus. We, we, we bound with, we be with her, O Lord Jesus. As she prayed for her family back home in Myanmar, O oh Lord Jesus. We pray for thy protection, O oh Lord Jesus. We pray for the blood of Jesus upon our family, O oh Lord Jesus. We pray for that country to be to come peace, O oh Lord Jesus. We, we pray, O oh Lord Jesus, that you want to see you a revival in Myanmar, O oh Lord Jesus. You can do it, O oh Lord. There is nothing impossible to you, O oh Lord Jesus. We know, O oh Lord Jesus, there is nothing impossible to you. We will see you in Myanmar, O oh Lord Jesus. And we will see a revival there, O oh Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory, Father, for there is none like you. We pray for person with the family as they prepare for going for deputation, O oh Lord Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, to do something great, O oh Lord Jesus. Let something new happen in their lives, O oh Lord Jesus. Even for the finances they need, O oh Lord Jesus. You are the great provider, O oh Lord Jesus. I know you can do anything from here, O oh Lord Jesus. I worship you, give you all the praise, O oh Lord Jesus. Even for all our the prayer needs, O oh Lord Jesus. We lift them in your hands, O oh Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory, Father Lord. Our help comes from you, O oh Lord Jesus. Our help comes from you, O oh Lord Jesus. And we give you all the praise, O oh Lord Jesus. I pray for blessings, O oh Lord Jesus. I pray, O oh Lord Jesus, for Sister Dela is going to lead us in worship, O oh Lord Jesus. Be with us, O oh Lord Jesus. Oh, give you all the praise. Let us worship all of us in our hearts with our Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory, Father. I say thank you for Pastor God, God. Give us the word, O oh Lord Jesus. I pray for your anointing upon him, O oh Lord Jesus. I pray the blood of Jesus upon him, O oh Lord, like never before. We worship you, give you all the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks. Can we clap our hands unto the Lord? Can we clap all of us as we want to go and worship the name of the Lord? Amen. We bless your name. 
day when tomorrow, meaning they're going to look for the names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Don't you look forward to that day when your name will be written and you will be allowed to go in heaven in the presence of Jesus forever and forever. On that special day, everything you've ever went through, everything that you've ever fought in the spirit, every temptation you've ever overcome, every trial you've ever had to face, it will all be worth it when your name is called and God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I tell you what, I want my name to be called on that wonderful day so that I may enter into the joy of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Praise God. That is our hope. That is our promise. And we look forward to that every single day. We welcome you to our Sunday morning service on live stream. Thank you to all those, uh, Brother Barack, Sister Delia, and Brother James of the media, and the, our technical crew, my Sister Esther and Sister Christine, Sister Elizabeth, those that are involved. And thank you for all you out there. I know many of you would be here. I hope all of you would be here if the doors were open. Uh, but we do know that we are currently still on a lockdown situation. They've really loosened up some restrictions, but not nearly enough that we are hoping for as far as church is concerned. So for this week and until further notice, we will have Wednesday night service at 7.45 p.m. Wednesday night service, 7.45 p.m. Live stream, not 8, it'll be 7.45 p.m. That is our new live stream time on Wednesdays for now. And then every Sunday, 11.30 is our live stream time. Now, I do want you to know that eventually we will come back to in-person services and our Sunday morning service will go back to 11 o'clock. Don't get too comfortable sleeping in. I know you've been probably sleeping in a little bit more, but for now, Sunday morning is 11.30, so when we do come back for live in-person services, you'll have to get up early because that means you'll have to get dressed and wash your face and comb your hair. And so don't get too comfortable sleeping in. That's good to take advantage now, maybe, but pretty soon with the help of the Lord, we'll be back in services in person. All right, and, and so we do have some announcements. This Saturday uh, at 4 p.m., there's gonna be a Bible quiz tournament. Now, Sister Esther, my daughter, and Sister Hannah Bonagwin, uh, they have been involved in Bible quizzing, but uh, the German-speaking nations were allowed them to get involved. And then maybe it'd be a good opportunity for others if they wanted to. Uh, it's their program, and, and, and they have everything, and they do it through Zoom. Uh, but these two found out about it and requested to be involved. And so they're going to have a Bible quiz tournament, and we're going to live stream it. Uh, we're actually, we're not going to live stream it. We're going to be showing it here at the church. So if anyone wants to come to support them, that'll be this Saturday at 4 p.m. I don't know, uh, probably we can't fit a lot, but I don't know, suppose that a lot of people will come. And, and so they will be Bible quizzing this Saturday. Also, praise God, we are excited about that and happy for them. That'll be at 4, 4 p.m. At 6 p.m., uh, I'm going to be preaching the youth service for the German-speaking nations on Zoom. And so it's going to be a Zoom thing. It's in conjunction with that Bible quizzing. But that will be, if you, some of you young people, it would be good for you to be on that Zoom uh, so that you can interact with some other young people and, and just you can't get enough of God and the people of God and the Word of God. All right. Uh, Saturday at 8.30 p.m., we're going to have a youth Instagram live. So Saturday will be a busy day in the morning. Saturday at 8.30 p.m. is our youth Instagram live. We're having them once a month, but guess what? We had one yesterday, and that was, this is March, but next Saturday is actually already a new month in April. And, and so, you're not going to want to miss this Saturday's Instagram live. We have a special treat. Many of you have heard of Brother Nathan French. He is a wonderful apostolic singer and songwriter. He uh, sang at North American Youth Congress, and so Brother... Brother Nathan French will be our special speaker for the Instagram Live this Saturday at 8.30 p.m. And so we are looking forward to hearing from Brother Nathan French. 
Next Sunday. Next Sunday is our mission service. And so we have tried to push it back, but we're already in April. We cannot push it back any further. So please, I need all of our members to be on there online on this sun next Sunday, uh, April 4th. We're going to have our missions recommitment service. And this is what, the way we'll do it. I'll give you more instructions, but you'll be able to send in through private message your pledge for 2021. Now, I do understand some uh, may not feel comfortable with that. We encourage you to do that. But nevertheless, regardless, we just want you, God knows, uh, it, whether you have it on an envelope or you send it through private message or, or whatever, when you make a pledge, it's really a pledge to the Lord. That's what it is. To give to missions, which is sending the gospel beyond the four walls of this church. In Greece and even in other countries, we try to have a burden to not just preach, but to send and to give so that the word of God may reach as many souls as possible. Because God is coming back soon. And Lord Jesus, as many souls as we can bring into the kingdom, any way that we can, we want to do it in the name of Jesus. We ask you to please continue praying for us. We are preparing, as you know, for deputation not till July, but we're believing that God's going to significantly decrease that. And, and so your prayers can help that. Uh, we're trying to get what's called PIMs, which is partners, pledges from North American churches and individuals. And uh, so we're, we're already going online and we have got some. And the more we can do online, that means the more we can get before we get there, which means the less we'll have to be there. And so one of the advantages of the Internet is... You can send out emails, you can put out social media, Facebook, Instagram, and, and all these things. And we're going to do it. We're going to utilize it as much as we can to, uh, to our advantage in order to get PIMs and support so that we can have a short reputation. But you can help us by praying. Please pray that God would be with us. And when we put things out there, if you know someone in North America, you can share it uh, specifically people there and pastors that may want to have us come or may want to partner with us before we ever even get there. Today is the last message in, in, in this series, meaning it, I, it was a series of lessons, messages about the way of the strange woman and using the strange woman as a type and a figure of the world, all right? The world is a type it could be symbolized by a wicked woman that tries to seduce you into doing that which is not right and getting you into a relationship with the world, which is not what God desires because really God is a jealous God and we are the bride of Christ. And so God does not want to share you or me or the church with the world. And how do we do that? By allowing wicked worldly things into our life into our family, into our church, and into our homes. How does it enter into your life? Through your eyes, through your ears, through your heart. All right? So, let's make it very simple today. What are ways of our forms of holding hands with the strange woman? And I said to you that the world is a type of figure of a lustful, adulterous lady that is trying to entice and seduce. And so if she were doing that, one of the ways that, uh, by the way, the young people have been having classes called Worth the Wait, and it's very wonderful. I would encourage any uh, parents, well, they've already actually started, they never do it again to get your children involved. It talks about the importance of keeping yourself pure for God from a biblical perspective. But one of the things that is powerful is touch. Touch is powerful. Uh, that's why, you know, even in the altar, a man pray for a woman. I, I, I tell our ministerial team, the best thing to do is if you lay hands on their head. You know, even if you're praying for a woman, you don't want to be hugging her, rubbing the back, none of, none of that stuff, because even in a situation like that, touch is powerful and touch can stir up emotions and so 
I think it would be very, very appropriate to say that, Pastor, it would not be right for you to be holding hands with another lady other than my wife. Of course, at times with Esther, like Naomi and my daughters, you know, we're, I'm their daddy. But what would, if you, what would you do if you saw Pastor walking down the street just holding hands <laughs> with another lady? You'd be like, what's going on here? That doesn't seem right. That's not, Sister Christine would probably put her for fists, you know, and get mad and say, that's, that's my man. <laughs> And, and so, the same way with God. How do you think God would feel if you're his bride, as the bride of Christ, and he saw you holding hands with a wicked, strange woman? But that is exactly what happens when you flirt with the world and the things of the world. You arouse the jealousy of God because God said you're supposed to be holy and separate. And so ways that you can hold hands with the strange woman are through music. You know, music has an effect upon you. Music is, it affects your mind and your spirit. And so when you fill yourself with ungodly music, it can affect your spirit. Even the way you talk. Of course, curse words and cuss words, of course, we know that is not right. And that should not come out of the mouth of a, of a Christian. But even worldly talk, talking about worldly things, uh, talking about uh, immoral things and telling jokes that are not godly. Those are, that's the way the world talks. You know, if you've ever worked, I used to work at the hospital. I don't know if I've shared this story, but there is a coworker of mine, a man, that he loved to tell bad jokes about ladies. And, and so it got to the point, honestly, church, where every time I seen that guy, I would go the other way because I knew he was going to fill my ears with junk. Literally, I, I would see the guy and I would hide because every time I saw that guy, he had to say a dumb joke. And the, the thing about it was he knew I was a Christian and he even knew I was a minister. And so it's like this guy was purposely trying to fill my mind with junk, my ears with dirt. And, and so you don't want to open your ears to that type of worldly talk. Even the way you dress. I'm not going to get into all the specifics here today about standards. But I would just say, some people say, well, God only cares about the heart. God does not only care about the heart. God does care about the heart. But your outward appearance is a reflection. It's like saying, you know, I, I just love my wife as long as what's in her heart. Well, what if my wife was walking down the street with uh, a bikini? <laughs> Well, I just love the heart as long as I, I know she's faithful to me as long as her heart is right. Well, then why is she showing her body to half the world? That it doesn't, you see what I'm saying? That, that any husband in his right mind would not want his wife to be showing herself to all the other men out there. Well, we belong to God. And the way that we appear in the outward is a reflection of our God. We are representatives of Jesus upon this earth. These are all ways of holding hands with a strange woman. Even our, our conduct in this world and in the church. We can have worldly conduct and you can have very, very uh, modest outward apparel but very, very worldly have a very, very worldly attitude. In fact, attitude is the most important part of holiness. Uh, and, and so we have to also make sure that we have a holy attitude and spirit and not bring into the church worldly methods uh, and let me give you an example the world it, it's like in, in a business sometimes the way you go up is by stepping on the people and just you don't care about nobody else as long as I get promoted but that's not the way in the church we don't say well forget that brother and that sister as long as I you know get promoted no the Bible says we are to prefer our brother above ourselves and so we have to have love one for another and we realize it's not about trying to go higher in the sense of pushing other people aside but it's trying to get closer to God and if God exalts you glory be to God we do want to be used to God but not at the expense of other people not by hurting other people the world hurts other people in order to go higher but the church does not hurt other people because that is a worldly method. We have to love our brother and our sister. 
Let me tell you this. Taking a stand for holiness and saying no to the strange woman can sometimes be a lonely path. If you're ever going to stand for God, you are going to encounter loneliness at one time or another. Because there's going to come a time and point where God may separate you and allow you to go through it by yourself. We always have the church, and thank God for leaders and pastors, but there's going to come a time and point where no one's going to be around you, and God's going to see, do you have enough courage to stand by yourself? It was easy when the three Hebrew boys had Daniel, their leader with them, and they said, no, we are not going to eat the king's meat and the king's, drink the king's wine. But when they were forced to bow down or else be thrown into the fiery furnace instead of that golden image, Daniel wasn't with them. God didn't allow Daniel to be with them. Why? I don't know. Ask God. I just know that they were not there with Daniel, but yet they were put to the test without their leader. And let me tell you, they passed the test because they said, Oh, King, King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not bow. Is there someone here today that can tell the Lord, Jesus, I'm not going to bow. That can tell the world and the devil, I'm not going to bow to you. And so, other practical ways of being holy unto the Lord. And you may not realize this, but in your relationships. And especially speaking of the man-woman romantic relationship. The Bible obviously says to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And that means that you shouldn't date or marry people that are not in apostolic truth. Some people say, well, they're a Christian. Just because they're a Christian, you can still be unequally yoked. It's not just having the title of Christian, but do they believe the apostolic truth? Do they believe in the necessity of baptism in Jesus' name? Do they believe in the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking of their tongues? Do they believe in holiness? There are a lot of people out there that they still baptize in Jesus' name. They're still filled with the Holy, the Holy Ghost, but they have completely let go of holiness. And for you to be in that type of relationship, in my opinion, this is my opinion, would be unequally yoked. All right. But let me take it a step further. You can even be in a relationship that is uneven in the church. What are you talking about? Well, if you have a desire to go high for God and you're on fire for God, but yet you have someone you want to marry that's dead, they just sit there in the church, they don't ever clap, you know, they come sometime and, and they're, they're not faithful. That, that doesn't, there's not an even dedication to God. And, and so that is a part of our walk with the Lord. Let me tell you this. The person that you like speaks volumes of your spirituality. If somebody came to me and said, Pastor, you know, I, I'm really on fire for God, but I want to marry this lady. And, and, and you see that, and I see that person and they're dead or they're, they're dead, they don't pray at all. I'm like, you don't have to tell me that speaks volume of your spirituality because who you are attracted to speaks volumes of what you desire in life. If someone is attracted to an unspiritual person, don't tell me you're spiritual, but the person you're attracted to is unspiritual. Because if you're spiritual, you're going to be attracted to spirituality. You're going to have what someone that has a common dedication and desire for God. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 9 says this. The psalmist said, or not the psalmist, the wise man said, Proverbs. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Why? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and they want, and thy want, as an armed man. Let me tell you that that strange woman will try to lull you to sleep. Now, I know maybe it's a guy thing. I don't know, a boy thing. But I know Judah. 
you know, he loves to be in Mama's lap. When, he, when Judah wakes up, the first thing he wants to do is go straight to my wife. And we're, we're always, when he wakes up, we're praying there in our living room. And then you want to you want to sit in Mama. Not Daddy, but Mama. And, and he loves when she plays with his hair. And, and uh, that, you know, he just loves that. And even me too, if, if my wife is playing with my hair, I'll fall asleep. I'll, I'll feel so relaxed. Because there's something soothing. There's something that just puts you to sleep. And, and maybe that's what Delilah did with Samson. Put her hair through, her hands through his hair and he just, you know, started falling asleep. But that strange woman will lull you to sleep and desensitize your convictions. Little by little, the world will try to put you to sleep spiritually and take away this conviction and that conviction. And little by little, where once you were a separate apostolic, now the devil wants you to look exactly like the world and take no stands for separation. But you cannot allow the devil to let you fall asleep spiritually. You got to stay awake. You got to stay aware. You got to understand that there's a devil that's trying to destroy you. And there's a world that is trying to contaminate you and to get you to lose your relationship with God. That is one of the tactics of the world, the strange woman. Instead of trying to get you to just backslide in one day, little by little, she gets you to try to fall asleep spiritually. And you take one step away from God and another and another. And before you knew it, you're just totally opposite. I, I have seen it in my years walking with the Lord, and some of you have too. People in churches that once stood for truth, they begin to let go of things here and there. And now you see him, see them, and you would not even know that they are apostolic Pentecostal. Their identity, their holiness. Their separation, it's gone. Because little by little, they let the devil take away this and take away that. But we got to stand guard and say, devil, we are going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are going to be pleasing unto the Lord. Samson followed that strange woman. Literally. Strange women, actually. And he got caught in the end. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Samson and his parents were grieved and says, couldn't you find a, a, a wife or a, somebody that you would like amongst the Israelites? Why do you have to go to those heathen and idolatrous Philistines? But Samson had a weakness for women. And, and so it ended, it ended up bad. He didn't. Uh, he ended up losing that wife. She died, and her father, and and he had a big fight with the Philistines. But he could have been spared a lot of trouble had he stood within actually the the requirements of marrying an Israelite. But he wanted a worldly girl. Judges sixteen one. Then went Samson to Gaza. And he saw there in Harlot. Now, the first Philistine lady, that ended up a disaster. And now in Judges 16, 1, he goes down to Gaza and he sees a, a prostitute, a harlot. And he went in, went in unto her. And so Samson could not stay away from those strange women. And this last strange woman is the one that was his destruction. He met Delilah. And Delilah... She went after to, she was paid and she went after to find the source of his power, the source of his strength. And finally, through her enticing, as I said, I don't know, maybe she rubbed her hair through his hair. Maybe she batted her eyes at him. And maybe, you know, she, she gave him all this soft talk. And finally, Samson gave her the secret to his strength. And he expected to rise up out of there with strength and defeat the Philistines. But he realized that his strength had gone. They took him. And the first thing those Philistines did was they plucked out his eyeballs. They, they took away his eyesight. 
The devil will blind you to make you think you're all right. One of the first things that he will do, and I'm talking not, I'm talking about people that give in to worldliness. You know, they, they, they're very defensive. I, I'm all right, you know. Well, God sees my heart. Uh, you don't need that. They're very defensive. They're blinded to think they're all right, even though they have begun to let go of righteousness and holiness. You'll see it again and again, that defensive spirit, because uh, the devil has blinded them to think they're all right when they're really not. And then the, the Philistines, after they had blinded Samson, they got him and they began to put him to work grinding for them. And so after that, the devil blinds you through the ways of the world, he will get you to do his work. What are you talking about? I, people that, that get that spirit, they're not satisfied just for them to be worldly. But before you know it, they seek to influence other people and they whisper in other ears and they say, you don't have to do that. You know, the, 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 you don't have to be holy. You don't have to be separate. It's not enough for them to lose their holiness, but they want to influence as many other people as possible to let go of holiness. And in actuality, what they are doing is they're doing the devil's work. They're taking people away for the devil. And, and so we don't want to be like that. We don't want to allow that to happen, but we want to be aware of the tactics of the world and the devil. I wonder, the strange woman, all in that, that whole passage in Proverbs written by Solomon, most likely. I wonder if Solomon knew that he was nearly prophesying and observing his own life in the future. Because do you know that Solomon had over a thousand wives? And in his older age, his wives caused him to worship idols and to turn against the God of Israel. Could it be that somebody that wrote about it, that preached about it, fell into the trap that they warned others about? I want you to know this morning that him that stand and take heed, lest he fall. Don't think because you've preached about it and because you've talked about it that you can never fall. I had to stand guard because the devil would love to take me down that road even though I preached about it. Doesn't mean that I am exempt. I have to be cautious and aware and seek out my own salvation with fear and trembling. When you get the spirit of the world in, into you, you get the spirit of Antichrist into you. Now, don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying because you're worldly, you're the Antichrist. No. You know, there's one Antichrist. And, and uh, if you're worldly, I'm not calling you the Antichrist. But let's read 1 John 4, 3. 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Where have you heard that it should come? And this is what John said way back then. And even now already is it in the world. The Antichrist was not alive, but the spirit of Antichrist. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're in Greece, and Antichristos is actually Greek. And so Antichrist, uh, Christ, Christos is actually the equivalent of the Hebrew for Messiah. And, and so, and it means the anointed. Christ was the anointed one. And so, when you're, that, that antichrist spirit means that the world has an anti-anointing spirit. It's opposed to Jesus. It's opposed to the anointing. And so it's against. Doesn't mean that everyone out there in the world is the antichrist, but that anti-church spirit is prevalent in the world and John says even back then that spirit is in the world now and if it was back then I can tell you for sure it is in the world now and so when you get the spirit of the world in you you're getting that anti-anointing anti-christ spirit that is against God 
You see, the world and God don't get along together. They repel each other like water and oil. Don't tell me you're on fire for God, but you're full of the world. It don't work like that. You've got to either be full of God or you can be full of the world. But Lord Jesus, breathe all the world out of me, God. I want to be full of the Spirit of God this morning. And when you have that worldly spirit, you will stay under the yoke. You, you might be struggling with something today, and you might have sins and things that don't that you can't get rid of, and you're wondering why. Let me tell you, the Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. A yoke is what they would put on oxen. It was like a, a an instrument that kept them pretty much confined, so that they would have to do the work. And, and so it was, you know, if you're under the yoke, you're you're in bondage. And so the thing that breaks the yoke, according to Isaiah, is the anointing. Well, how can the anointing break the yoke if you're anti-anointing? If you're against the anointing, you say, I'm not. Well, if you have the spirit in the world of the world in you, you are. Whether you realize it or not, you have the spirit of Antichrist working in your life because that is the spirit of the world. And as long as you have the world in your life, you're not going to break free of that yoke and that bondage, that addiction, that thing that has you bound. you got to get rid of that spirit of the world in you, and then you can find freedom and deliverance. And when you have that worldly spirit, whatever you do in the church won't flourish. You might put on a show, you might have talent, but there's not going to be real anointing because the spirit of the world suppresses the anointing. Let me just tell you, playing here today, like that day when Jehu, that man that had been sent by God to kill Jezebel, and when he arrived there in his chariot, and Jezebel with her face painted up and, you know, her hair all fixed up. And she tried to seduce him looking out that window. And Jehu said, who is on my side? And those Ethiopian eunuchs looked out and they threw Jezebel out the window. She fell. And the Bible says he trod her underfoot. He, he basically ran over her with his chariot. And, and, and so, and he trapped, he threw her, they threw her out the window and he trampled her underfoot. You got to get that spirit of the world. You got to throw it out of your life. You got to trample it down and say, God, whatever's holding me back, I'm not going to flirt with it. I'm not going to play with it. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to stomp it down in the foot. Whatever's in my life keeping me back from you, Lord God. I don't want it no more, Jesus. I don't want the world. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you today. I know we're distant. I know I can't see your face, but God can see into your spirit. And could it be there are things in your life that you're holding back and you're hiding? And you can't hide from God, but these things are hindering your walk with God. I'm not perfect. Don't claim to be perfect. But I'll tell you what. I, I love revival. I want revival. And I love holiness. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe it's revival if you get people, but they, but you just water them down with false doctrine. That's a crowd. That's not revival. True revival comes with souls that have a revelation of truth. And part of truth is holy living. It can happen. It happened in the days of book of the book of Acts. So why not now? Amen. Now, I need you to pay close attention to me, right? I'm going to go slow, slow it down a little bit, but I, I want you to catch this understanding and this revelation. In the Old Testament, God gave Moses specific instructions in Exodus chapter 28 for the high priest's holy garments. The first high priest was Aaron, the brother of Moses, and all the high priests had to be direct descendants of Aaron. And the Levites, Moses and Aaron, were from the tribe of Levi, were the ones who were set apart to minister of the holy things in the tabernacle. And so you see, even when the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan, every tribe had their own portion. But the Levites did not have a portion. But they had cities. And God said, I am your portion. And I want you to understand this. It's all biblical and it's very important. That's why they didn't have their portion, but all Israel would bring their tithes 
to the tabernacle. And that is how the Levites were supported. You see, God said, you get this piece of land and you get that piece of land. But these Levites, they're going to minister in the tabernacle. And the high priest, his life was centered around the work of God. And all the people brought their tithe that supported the, 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 the priests and the, those Levites. And so they didn't just wear anything when they went about the Lord's business. They had specific garments, a specific uniform that they were supposed to wear. And here we have a picture of it. Uh, they had a, they had, uh, first of all, they had a fine linen tunic. A fine linen tunic or a type of a robe that was a coat of fine linen, the Bible says. And, and so it was white and that was an undergarment. And, and then they had the robe of the ephod. Uh, the robe of the ephod had bells on the bottom and pomegranates. And so they wore that on top of that fine linen tunic. And then on top of the robe of the ephod was the ephod. And, and then you can see this, it's, it's this multicolored uh, deal. And so they had that ephod that they wore. And on top, uh, there on their, on their chest, was a breastplate, very specific, onto the very exact materials that were going to be used for these things. And on that breastplate, they had 12 jewels for the 12 tribes of Israel with the names inscribed upon the jewels. And, and, and so they had that breastplate. And in that breastplate, they had a, a I think in the back, they had like a, a place where they could put the Urim and the Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim uh, were what, what, what helped them determine the will of God. Uh, many people think there were types of rocks that they would cast lots. And that's how they determined the will of God for a certain situation. And so the priests had all these specific garments that they wore. And then they had a girdle, which was like a belt or a sash. They had to be held together. I don't know if you remember the New Testament. That's where the Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind. And so you got to keep things in check. Uh, and so that girdle was like a belt that they tightened it up. And, and so they had that girdle. And then, listen to this. Upon his head, he had what the Bible calls a mitre. The mitre was like a turban. And the, the, the high priest wore that upon his head. Everything very specific. I mean, they had to be exact. If not, they could, they could die. They had to do, this is what the high priest wore when he ministered. He could not go into the holy place or he could not go by the, the, the altar. Now, when they went to the holies of holies, they had something uh, different that they wore. But he had on that mitre, a on the forefront of that mitre, a plate of pure gold. And you can see it there. See the mitre, the turban? And then he had a plate of pure gold that he was required to wear as the high priest. The Bible calls it a holy crown. Now listen to this. Carved on that plate of pure gold, the Bible says, like unto the engravings of a signet, and I'll explain what that is, was these words, holiness unto the Lord. Now, what was the engravings of a signet? Let me explain to you that. The engravings, you know, obviously it's something engraved. And so a signet was like a seal or a ring that a king or a dignitary had. And when there was a command or a law, the king sealed it with his signet. And that was irrevocable. It was not reversible. That's why when Daniel was... When they tricked the king and they said, if, he, if anyone prays, then, you know, then, then, then can you seal it that they'll be thrown to the lion's den? Even though the king loved Daniel, he could not reverse it because it had been sealed with the signet of the king. That's why in the book of Esther, when Haman tricked that king, Ahasuerus, into allowing all the Jews to be killed, even though that Haman had been hanged and put to death, it could still not be reversed because it was sealed with the signet, with those engravings that meant this is the signet of the king. 
And so in the book of Esther, he didn't, re he didn't say, I, I, I cancel it. What he did was say that all the Jews can defend themselves. And that was how it solved that problem. And so I need you to understand this because a signet was the seal of that specific king. Nobody could copy it. Nobody could counterfeit it. It was a mark that that was that king. The mark of this king or that king. And so I think it's so revelatory and so important today that like the marking of king of king, the king of glory, King God, that that high priest had a golden plate with the mark of the king upon his forehead. And the mark of the king was holiness unto the Lord. It had to be in his mind. It had to be in the forefront of his head or else he would die. He had to go into the presence of the Lord with the mark of the king. Holiness unto the Lord. Don't tell me today that holiness is not important to God. It was so important that God put it like into the engravings of his own signet on the forefront of that high priest's head on that mitre, on that golden plate. They couldn't enter the holy place, the tabernacle, without these garments. And can I tell you today, in like fashion, that you cannot go to heaven without holiness. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. I, I want you to know here today, it's not an ugly thing, it's not a forced thing, it's a beautiful thing that we represent King Jesus and we have the mark of the King upon us and that is holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord. Don't tell me that separation is not important to God. Let me tell you this, holiness, you got to catch this, has to be motivated by love. If not, it's just rules. And we're not here to enforce rules. Right. We're here to impress love for God in yeah, the people yeah, of God. Good. If, if you don't have love for God, then you're just wearing a uniform. You know, it's like you go to work and you put on a uniform. You, you, you go to school, you put on a uniform. Well, some people just go to church and they put on a uniform. Why? Because they're not motivated by that love for God. When you're motivated by love, it's not just the uniform, but it's the way you live because you love God and you want to please God. Let your holiness be fueled by a love for God. I heard a story some years ago, true story. There was an evangelist that was preaching all over the United States and he finally went back to his home church. Hadn't been there for a while because he'd been preaching so long, traveling. And his son was there, went to one of the youth events at, at, that, at their home church. They had been gone for some time. And the son, he, he observed some of the other young people there that were so unholy and worldly. And they were just, they weren't right. They, they were just worldly. And they were there, but they had allowed so much worldliness in their midst that you could hardly recognize them. And the son said, you don't love God. And they looked at him and they said, what are you talking about? We do love God. And that son said, no, you don't love God because the God I know is holy. If you love God, the God I know, my brothers and sisters, this God is holy. And if you love God, you're going to want to be holy because our God is holy. When my wife and I were boyfriend and girlfriend some years back, uh, I, I remember, you know, we're getting older now. We're, we're not there to the retirement years yet, <laughs> but we are not as young as we used to be. Um, we're still relatively young, but I remember when we were boyfriend and girlfriend, and uh, I remember my wife has naturally curly hair, and I remember times when I would I ask her to wear her hair down, and my, my heart would just skip a beat. And I remember she did, and now, of course, you know, she's still beautiful, and uh, she's still lovely. And, you know, she's had three children now, and, you know, your body and your hair changes. Some of us lose a little bit, and, you know, especially some of us and brothers may know what, you, what I'm talking about. But I remember when I would ask her that and she would wear it, it would just bring such a delight to my heart. 
And I guess I'll give you this secret also. Uh, we've been married so long, not really long, but we've been married en enough that for the most part now, my wife picks my clothes. <laughs> I, don't even, I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to wear for Sunday, so she picks it, she irons it. I, I, I can't even really buy a tie without her there because she's the one that matches everything. Whoa, why? Well, there's no lady I want to really please in this life other than my wife anyways. And so why not let her pick because she's the one that dressed to please. Well, it's the same way with God. If you really love God, then you dress to please God. If you really love God, then you talk to please God. If you really love God, then you think and you act to please God. And that is the attitude of holiness that you have to get. That, Lord, I love you, and I want to bring pleasure to you, God, in all that I do, in the way that I dress, in the way that I talk, in the things that I do, in the things that I say, God. Lord Jesus, I pray today that a love for God and holiness would rule and reign on our lives. I'm afraid that some have gotten the wrong concept. And some think it's just about I have to do this. And it's just about rules. And I'm forced to do that. Let me tell you, you've got it wrong. Would you get a revelation today that it's about love for God and we are the chosen people of God. God separated Israel out of all the nations in the world at that time. And they were his special people. And you and I are nobody. We're not Jews. But I thank God that God separated people from amongst the Gentiles that would, that would be obedient and be baptized in his name. And now we are the special people of God. And it is an honor to live for God and an honor to obey God's word. I'm going to come to a close here today. But I want to tell you, God is no respecter of persons. Whether you have multiple generations or your first generation in apostolic Pentecostal truth. I think of the heritage that I have been given, and it's only the grace of God. I, I, you know, I, my great-grandfather, I think it was around the year 1932 or 1933 or so, he was a 19-year-old orphan. And that 19-year-old orphan boy, he... he came into apostolic truth, was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. He started churches in California, won pastors and pastor's wives to the Lord that are now serving God to this day. And he got married with a young lady that her and her mother and her grandmother were all in this apostolic truth. One God, Jesus' name. And so when I go down the list from my great-grandmother's side anyways because it's her her mother and her grandmother little Judah Esther Naomi seventh generation apostolic Pentecostal truth and I'm not saying I'm greater than nobody because somebody could come in first generation and it's not a it doesn't matter your generations it matters your dedication and your personal zeal for God but let me tell you there's people before us that sacrificed for this truth. There's people before us that were persecuted for this apostolic truth. Don't you ever look at it and disregard it and think it's something, uh, I, I, I don't like to be different. No, it's a pleasure. There were people that lived for God and spoke in tongues when it was not popular. We gotta appreciate this heritage that we have. And until you come back, Lord God, we're gonna pass it to the next generation. We're going to pass it to new, new converts, God. We love this apostolic truth and holiness unto the Lord. Right now, let's lift up our hands and let's seek the Lord right now. Let's just pray and worship God as they sing unto God. Thank you, Jesus.